It's March 1st, 2020, and we are back with another episode of Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden, and returning to the show, I'm so happy, is... <laughs> Danielle Hallen. Oh my goodness. It's so good to be back. It felt like an absolute eternity, you guys. Yeah. I'm telling you. I'm, we only do one show a month. And I only get to meet with my best friend one time a month <laughs> to film. I'm being serious. I only get to, you know, feel this connection with you guys one time a month. And I missed it so bad, you guys. I'm so happy to be back. And I want to thank you for your patience with me. You know, thank you for how kind you guys were to Stephanie. She is the bomb. I'm so pleased. Boy, is and, she. She's yeah. a bomb in more ways than one. We're going to get to that later. <laughs> But yeah, um, it was amazing to see your support. Thank you guys so much for letting Stephanie come in and being so supportive of her. And by the yeah. way, if there's any Harlequins out there that are tagging <laughs> along for the ride, we welcome you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us some more. And I did just also want to call out, um, there were so many kind wishes for you, Danielle. So yeah. many people just want to make sure you're okay. Can you just tell us, is everything okay? Yes, I'm okay. I'm trucking through. Life just throws things sometimes and you got to ride the wave. Yeah. And right now I'm at the other side of the wave and I'm so happy to be here. And I am so thankful for each and every one of you that was, you know, took the time to make sure I was all right. Because I'm telling you, sometimes it can, it can feel scary when you're going through things in life and to see people that don't even, you know, know you face to face, you know, haven't seen you in person for them to take that time just to care. Yeah. It's awesome, you guys. And I appreciate it even more than you know. Yeah. We've got a very amazing audience. And yeah. uh, thank you guys so much for all the support around that. Uh, we're going to hear about some other people that are going through some stuff on today's episode, <laughs> yeah. talking about yep. criminal athletes. But before we get to that, voting results for last episode, which was the Valentine's Day Crimes. Now, this is a standalone episode. Uh, we were playing for charities. <laughs> On the Twitter poll, Stephanie took 63% and I got 37%. Hmm. I wonder where this is going. Uh, you did you did say she was the bomb, right? I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's detonating over here. Uh, YouTube poll, Stephanie pulled 71%. Oh, my goodness. And I pulled 29. Um, so obviously, that means that the winner was Stephanie Harlow. Of course, uh, she was playing for a charity and I reached out to Stephanie. She recorded a little something for us. Let's listen to that together. Hello, Crime After Crimers. Thank you guys so much for voting me the winner. I was so thankful to be invited on to be a part of the podcast. I'm so glad Danielle's back. I'm so glad everybody liked my story. And thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for voting me the winner so that my charity, St. Jude's, could get a donation. Thank you. I love you guys. Stay kind, stay beautiful. And I'll see you soon. Man, she's a force to be reckoned with. She came in and did the thing. She did. She did. Well, I needed a replacement for Danielle, right? Yeah. Got to pick the cream of the crop here. That's what we got. She came in and uh, it, sh it probably should have been you kicking my butt. And instead of that, Stephanie brought her own boot and gave it to me. There um, we go. Yeah. So what we decided is that all the money raised on Patreon for this month will go to St. Jude's. And that is going to be more than $200. So a big thank you to our patrons. Big thank you to Stephanie. And she was playing for an awesome cause. And just so everyone knows, I was playing for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Don't mm -hmm. fret because I actually make a monthly donation to them. And I've been doing that for a while too. So they're still getting funds in all this as well. Now it is time for us to get back to the season long competition between <laughs> Danielle and myself. It's time for voting results with Danielle. All right, you guys, if you don't remember, this was the birth year crime. So it was 75 versus 92, two pretty crazy years. And on Twitter, I received 30% of the votes and John received 70% ouch. <laughs> You, I knew it. I knew that was going to happen. I call that a Stephanie Harlow. I, I, I Stephanie Harlow to you. 
You sure did, man. And on the next one, it's even worse because on YouTube, I received 25% of the votes and you received 75%, John. Wow. Wow. Blew me out of the water. That was a good one. That was so hard. It was. It was um, It was an interesting topic and it yeah. was kind of interesting to me how our stories, you know, seem to line up like they usually do, despite the fact that we were picking whatever crimes just from and two very different years. <laughs> exactly. I know. It was crazy. Yeah. But you did a great job. You came in, you kicked booty, and I'm here to give you the cutback. <laughs> oh, thank God. It's been so long. Where is it? Been, I need it. I've been it. hoarding it this whole time. Okay. Hey, thank you. Look at that. You're it's like welcome. you weren't gone at all. That was the best handoff we've had in months. I know. <laughs> Look, telling you, just give me a little bit of a breather and I'll come back. My mm-hmm. story my story might knock you out of the water just like that. That cut past in. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> she's she's talking it up. So for the season two totals for right now, we have Danielle with two and myself with three. Once again, another year of us yeah. going neck and neck. But Danielle, it's gonna be different this year because now with Stephanie's episode, mm-hmm. we're gonna end with an odd number of episodes. So it it'll be a straight out win. We won't have to go to the numbers. It's gonna I kind of like that though. I kind of like was, that. Yeah, but we can't do it every year. And it was <laughs> it was so cool because you know it was, we were like less than it was just over a percent difference ultimately I when know, it boiled it was down. Insane. Yeah. All right. So time to get to this month's topic: criminal athletes. You know, with everyone talking about the new Netflix docu series "Killer Inside: The Mind of Aaron Hernandez," we thought it was a good time to look into some other <laughs> criminal athletes that maybe you haven't heard about before. Danielle, have you watched? I haven't seen Killer Inside yet. Have you watched it? I did. I watched it right when it came out. And I wasn't very familiar with the story at all. But wow. I thought it was very, very interesting. The whole entire thing. And it like just came up out of the blue, I almost feel like. He had all these issues growing up. You know, certain things that might have been holding him back. Um, making him feel kind of like not... I don't know the right word to describe it not adequate with, you know, he he felt like he couldn't kind of measure up. Mm -hmm. Um, But they took a very interesting turn looking into his psychology and how those things might have played into it. And then there was this other turn of, you know, maybe it's all these head injuries from playing football. I don't know. It was it was very interesting. It was very wild. It was interesting to see the people who supported him versus who didn't. And after looking into all these different criminal athletes, there's a lot of them. It makes me it really does make me wonder if there's something just about it, about the pressure, you know, about the lifestyle that really just snaps people because I was shocked. I definitely expected to find a bunch of criminal athletes, but the severity of a lot of their crimes. Yeah. It was very, very interesting. Yeah. There's, there's some that go to very, very dark places. And uh, something we were talking about before we started recording today is you probably could very easily have a true, true crime podcast specifically just about criminal athletes. There are so many stories, but we had to work to try to pick the best or at least one that's going to knock out the other host (laughs) on this show. And it is time for Danielle to tell hers. All right, you guys. So today I'm going to be speaking about Byron McLaughlin. A lot of you guys probably won't even know who that is. Do you know who it is, John? No, I don't. And I didn't look into it on purpose. I wanted to be completely surprised for this. So, Well, that's almost what's so shocking is that I've never heard of this before. So Byron McLaughlin was born on September 29th, 1955 with a passion for baseball. Growing up in California, he played through most of his childhood, followed by the minor league up until January 1977, when he just so happened to have a great season pitching, and he ended up being signed to the Mariners, which started his career in the major leagues. Nice. But unfortunately, Byron wasn't really a great team player, or according to most people, even a great baseball player at all. He just kind of got lucky. Mm. And at the time, the Seattle Mariners were not known to have the best team. They lost, I believe that year, 98 games total. And (laughs) exactly. And they were so tight on funding. I'm pretty sure some of the trainers were told they'd have to find their way back from one of the competitions they were in. You know, wow. bad. Yeah, bad. The players weren't that great. And Byron in particular was known to be a wild card. He kind of did what he wanted when he wanted with no regard for the rest of the team. He would randomly decide to try out new pitches. He spent a lot of time trying to convince the coaches that he had better training methods. And he always had a knack for hurting himself in bizarre ways that left him complaining, which is what everyone remembered the most, and also unable to play. 
Uh oh. So because of his bizarre habits and him not getting along with anyone, the Mariners ended up sending him back and forth between their main team and the Mexican League Nuevo Laredo, based in a town along the Rio Grande on the border. Mm -hmm. And it was here that he ended up meeting his first wife and a change of strange events and criminal decisions began to unfold. The first event that happened was after his own wedding. Byron and his team had traveled back to Mexico. They had been in Seattle for him to get married, and he ended up leaving a gym bag in the hotel that his roommates were staying at. And he instructed his trainer, Gary, casually, Gary Nicholson, to bring his bag back to Seattle for him. Now, what Gary wasn't expecting was what was found inside of the bag while going through the x-ray machine during his travels home. A 357 Magnum. <clears throat> oh, man. Yeah. Wow. Now, Gary was obviously detained and searched, and he ended up missing his flight. But not only that, McLaughlin had the nerve <laughs> to scold Gary for bringing the entire team bad press. Mm. He then asked for his gun back, blamed Gary for everything, and then never apologized. <laughs> But I, that, I want to let you guys know how important, though, that that one statement is at describing what kind of person Byron was, because yeah. that is him in a nutshell. Nothing could ever be his fault. Everyone else should have fixed a problem, regardless of if he started it or not. Mm hmm. Now, the Mariners ended up cutting him the following season, probably from his lack of skill, his attitude, the gun incident. And he ended up going back to the Mexican League. Now, at this time... Nuevo Laredo was known for some of their players being something called wheeler dealers, which I'm sure a lot of you are kind of aware of what that term is. Okay. I'd, he I'd heard it before. Basically, it's people who, you know, they would have these great jobs and you'd think they'd earn a lot of money from it, but they don't. But it also put them in a position where they're able to run things like guns and drugs and other important export deals across the border for extra money. And this is likely where the idea for his future criminal plans began. But while these plans were cooking, he was still determined to make his baseball career dream come true. Again, someone that just doesn't give up. Wow. In 1983, he ended up playing for the Angels, but then that ended quickly after he bashed other teams for treating him badly. And then he ended up with another injury that he refused to go to rehab for. His life was falling apart and his wife decided to file for a divorce. Now, while no criminal charges were filed here, she did claim that he was abusive and he would take her money. And this led him into a spiral into the next legal issue of his. Two months after she left him and all of this started, he ended up arrested for selling or attempting to sell 11 ounces of cocaine mm. to an undercover cop in California. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. I thought originally that the bag was going to have some <laughs> drugs in it, too, that he was trying to get someone else to oh, basically yeah. be a mule. But oh, yeah, <laughs> gun, exactly. Just as bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But as you can imagine at this point, after trying to sell an undercover cop 11 ounces of cocaine, his baseball career that was already a wreck to begin with was officially over and his life at, wife had left him and he needed to figure out another way to survive. But for someone who had lost their professional career and everyone expected him to kind of crumble after this, he somehow seemed to be doing fine and no one could figure out how. He moved to a small suburb in California, close to the Mexican border. He lived a really lush lifestyle, drove a beautiful Mercedes. He had a beautiful home. He loved taking daily swims in his beautiful pool. Mm -hmm. But little did anyone know that his time in Mexico with the Wheeler Dealers gave him a business opportunity. That is, until a customs agent in Arizona received a call from a Mexican port of entry in August of 1989. A trailer had been detained coming into Mexico from the U.S., and it contained 385 cartons of sneakers. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. The cartons had well-known logos on, logos on them, such as Vans, Adidas, Converse, Fila, and the destination was a well-known Mexican industrial port city. So it very well could have been just a shipment of well-known sneakers, but the issue was that all of the shoes were labeled as being made in the United States, mm -hmm. but the shipment originated from South Korea. Oh, okay. So okay. obviously that's a big old red flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the customs agent decided to check out the paperwork and through the searching, only one name popped up and that was Byron McLaughlin. <laughs> yes. Within two days, a PI posed as a shoe buyer and showed up at an office that Byron himself had set up in Coronado. Everything seemed legitimate from the outside. I mean, it had a plaque, it looked legal, but the second a tour started inside, things started to fall apart. 
There were fax numbers labeled as the port city in Mexico the shoes were trying to go to. Um, there were fax numbers also na- labeled with the name Glenn, which was his brother, and then the initials DY. There were even invoice faxes for shoes lying around with the same city in South Korea where the original trade originated from. Something fishy was going on. Now, from there, the PI wanted to go to one of Byron's branches in Mexico to see if more information could be found there. So he got in touch with one of the men running the branches down there and a tour was scheduled. During this tour, samples of sneakers were shown, but they had no manufacturing date. Mm -hmm. No factory code. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Apparently the colors and the shoe did not match. And it was like a drastic difference. It wasn't even just like, and this shade of green's a little off. It was like, who on earth (laughs) was colorblind and tried to make the shoe? Um, It was horrible. The quality was horrible. They were pretty sure it was, oh my gosh, I can't remember exactly what they said it was. It was, they were claiming it was leather, but. But it's pleather. It might as, yeah, well, far even past that. They thought. It was horrible. And they ended up finding similar tax information as well. So at this point, they concluded the shoes were counterfeit. Mm -hmm. So the PI spent the next couple of months compiling all the information possible to hopefully shut down the counterfeit shoe business. They visited Byron's office many times, again, claiming they wanted to buy, when actually they were going through his trash and collecting all the different invoices and letters he was getting. And slowly their evidence started to grow and it actually proved that this small business was a lot larger than they expected. The the individual behind the initials DY, it was a huge mystery and they kept trying to figure out who it was. And finally, when they connected the dots, they found that it was a businessman from South Korea and not just any businessman, but a well-known huge one known for manufacturing counterfeit products. Mm -hmm. And Byron had apparently met him during his time playing for the Mexican league through these Wheeler dealers. Byron would pay between only eight and eleven dollars per pair of shoes and then flip the shoes for at least twice that. He would then stash the money in an account at the International Bank of Luxembourg to keep it safe. Yeah. During his best months, you guys, he could sell up to eighty thousand pairs of sneakers a month. That why, earned why him isn't well he going, over six figures. Why isn't he going <laughs> legit? If you can sell shoes like that, sell shoes, man. You would think so. <laughs> You would think you would. Yeah, it's crazy. And and this is exactly what was supporting this life that everyone was so confused about after his baseball career ended. Wow. Now, once Customs finally had enough information, warrants for 18 individuals were issued. And on November 28th, 1989, Customs agents and half a dozen officers descended on Byron's home in Coronado to arrest him. They had absolutely no idea what to expect Mm -hmm. at all. He, everyone knew he was a jerk. (laughs) He was mean to absolutely everyone. He had a horrible attitude and they really expected him to fight back. But after a few minutes of knocking on the door and waiting, he casually came to the door, looked at them all and asked if he was invited to the party. (laughs) He's a mess, I'm telling you. (laughs) All of his assets were seized or frozen. They found four and a half million dollars in cash, cars, jewelry, gold, and real estate. And his bank account alone held 2.4 million. Oh my God. Now, this is the kicker, and no one will be surprised at this. Once he was arrested, he didn't argue at all about what he had been doing. But that's because Byron and his lawyers were dead set on the fact that he was doing absolutely nothing illegal. Oh, wow. He was genuinely shocked that he was being arrested and charged with all of this. He claimed that the sneakers were made outside of the country and sold outside of the country, so therefore no U.S. laws were broken. Mm. He also claimed it was all gray market goods. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's just goods that are manufactured in the same factories as the real thing. And like, they're kind of technically the real thing. They just don't have licensing marks. And usually there's something else wrong with them. They also argued that only a small portion or a small percent of the shoes originally detained in Mexico were formally labeled as counterfeit. So, and I kid you not, they said most of his business was legitimate. (laughs) (laughs) They weren't letting it go. He was displaying the exact same qualities he had while playing baseball. Do crazy things. Blame everybody else. Yep. Yep. Byron ended up being charged with trafficking counterfeit goods, entry of goods by means of smuggling, and violating seven sections of the U.S. Code. But not just that. He also ended up with civil suits from most of the shoe companies that he screwed because he made their money absolutely tank. 
Yeah. But despite the fact that Byron had this entire time acted as if he was such an innocent man, those close to him slowly started to turn on him. And with repeated blows from them and the different companies, he seemed to grow tired of fighting. And I'm just going to add in there. He seemed. <laughs> I'm just going to make that. I'm just going to make that yeah, very clear. Yeah, this guy's not a quitter. <laughs> nope. His second wife came forward, agreed with the first, claiming that he was abusive. His employee said that his anger was so severe that he would throw and smash things in the office over the smallest issues. The thing they most remember was that his veins would pop out of his head. They, I'm serious. They referred to him as the devil behind his back. <laughs> But it's interesting because at the same time, his work was so sneaky and he was so confident in everything that he did mm -hmm. and genuinely convinced himself he wasn't doing anything wrong that not a single person working with him realized it was all illegal. Yeah. Not a single employee. Yeah. And after his true colors were shown, he felt defeated enough to admit his guilt in the civil cases from the shoe companies and the federal charges for money laundering. For this, brace yourself, <clears throat> he was only sentenced to five years probation. Oh, wow. wow. And he was also told that he would repay two and a half million dollars. Now, everyone believed he got off very easy considering what was going on. Yeah. With a low sentencing like that, most people would pay up, take the sentencing and run with it. And Byron wanted to run, but without owning up to a single thing. Days after this happened, Harley Lewin, who was the main counterfeit lawyer involved in the case, received a phone call. And Byron was the one on the other end of the line. And all he casually said was, hey, Lewin, I'm not in the United States anymore. I just thought you should know. And he hung up. <laughs> Authorities were now on the chase again. And the bad thing is, is that he didn't think this through because his current wife that was in the middle of divorcing him had ties to France. And that's the first place that he went to. Mm. And that's the first place authorities thought to look. And guess what? They found him. <laughs> wow. wow. But upon, hear and upon hearing that Byron had fled, a U.S. judge ended up sentencing him immediately to 14 years because of it. Mm -hmm. But despite finding Byron, he was now in France. Right. And French authorities and even some U.S. authorities didn't want to act on the sentencing. The French said, this isn't our place. We don't need to do this. He's not causing any problems over here. It took a lot of a lot of pushing. And then finally, when the French agreed to put just surveillance on Byron for 48 hours to appease some of the U.S. government, he ran again. And this time he ended up in West Africa, which wow. apparently he had family there. But here he was finally detained but in true Byron fashion, this didn't last long either. Byron escaped. And while nothing has ever been proven, there are rumors that he bribed a guard with a Rolex. That, I would interestingly check that Rolex. enough, was thought to be fake. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> check the Rolex. <laughs> so he was escaping counterfeit charges using counterfeit goods. Not wow. like that's all too surprising. I've got a the, Louis Vuitton bag for this uh, guard here. <laughs> yeah. I know. But you would think a guard would be like, okay, this man, we detained him because he has counterfeit charges. If that same person walked up to him and was like, here, take this Rolex, I'd be like, you better go sit down. Seriously. <laughs> you need to go sit down right now. But this guard was like, heck yeah, get on out of here. Bye. Wow. Um, Oh, my goodness. There were still some searches for Byron after he escaped in West Africa. But at this point, a lot of people were just happy that his company had been shut down. The government didn't want to spend money to start a full on manhunt. He didn't have any access to his money he had previously made. He was out of the U.S., at least, causing issues. And the shoe companies almost immediately started seeing their profits increase again. Mm. So everything was just left alone. Wow. Over the years, Byron would occasionally call Lewin just to torment him from unknown locations. He would, it's like a child. He would call Lewin and say like, na 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 boo boo, like just like yeah. ridiculous outlandish things. And then at one point, Lewin actually met with Byron in France while on a business trip. Lewin said this case had haunted him forever because they worked so hard to nail him and then he ran. And so when he got the opportunity to go to a business trip in France, he, you know, tried to find a way to meet up with him. And I guess it was one of the phone calls where Byron was calling to rub everything in his face again. And he said he will never forget what it was like after all of those years of having no clue where Byron was after all of those phone calls to see him just casually sitting a free man in a hotel lobby. That's just so hanging weird. out. But you, you have to imagine that there's there's a weird relationship at that point. I mean, they've, oh, absolutely. they've been doing like tit for tat for so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's weird because I've, I've been in things like that, too, with people that 
I supposedly hate. And at some point you're like, <laughs> why do I keep interfacing with them? Like there's there's something under this that isn't there just as simple yeah, as me hating this person. Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, when Lewin ended up meeting Byron, Byron tried to pay to settle his legal issues. He said he was tired of running around and he wanted to come back to the U.S., but his offers weren't even as high as what his sentencing had been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm he, sure he was like, here, have a have a couple of Rolexes and uh, I've got oh, some shoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's really nice shoes that you might want. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, I guess they did try to work out a couple of deals every once in a while. But once it would come down to it, Byron never kept his word and he just stayed in hiding. Now, as of 2018, Byron is still running. Wow. He Yes, he is thought to be in Thailand right now. Um, possibly working in the illegal import and export business again. Mm -hmm. But nobody has any idea. Wow. No one has any clue. Wow. I mean, all that money, all that time, all of that effort from the U.S. government, and he's just, he's just out there running still. It's so weird because, you know, he seems familiar enough with Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know people that go to Mexico frequently and, you know, you buy knockoff merchandise in Mexico. It's just kind of a yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. So why is he living so close to Mexico? Why not just move to Mexico? And, you know, I, I guess he needs to be able to sell the stuff. I think that's why he's moving it across the, the border and you yep. know, getting yep. a higher price in the U.S. than he would uh, trying to sell that because people in Mexico would be aware, oh, this is probably knockoff stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And wow. I just want to say a huge thank you real quick to Dan Green. He wrote an amazing article on this, and it was very easily digestible for someone that's not a huge sports fan, because not going to lie, when I first started looking into some of these stories, I'm seeing all these numbers pop up and these things happening, explaining their career, and it yeah. was like a bunch of mumbo jumbo to me. And I was really, I was really <laughs> concerned I wasn't going to get a case. I was. But he did, I mean, he did a great job brought it down to its bare bones and then i was able to look into the crime and that that i understand <laughs> yeah well and there's so, something else to it with which which is really this guy's personality i mean his personality and it's weird because i imagine he would have had to have been a decent athlete in some way because a tenacity i think is the right word to describe him he just he keeps coming back he keeps trying again um, so based on his history from what i saw like no one could make sense of him. He made like he made absolutely no sense because yeah. he had no typical pattern. Like they said he would come in and play a game and just blow everyone out of the water. Mm -hmm. But then the next game, you would think he never even made it past like peewee t-ball. Right. Like they would have to immediately take him out because yeah. he'd be doing so terrible. It would just be so all over the board. Inconsistent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But the main but the main reason they seem to really have issues with him, I think he was mainly like a he was a relief player for the most part. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, but the main issue everyone had with him was just his attitude like he thought he knew better than everyone he thought he did better than everyone you could smash all of his numbers in his face yeah. and show that he was not better than everyone and he wouldn't see it he wouldn't believe it he was a very self-centered narcissistic person yeah he seemed to be playing a lot of the blame game too you know um and I've, I heard a great saying once I, th I think I saw it on a poster or something but it was like uh when you point a finger there's three pointing back at you. Yep. And it, this is the guy that just kind of encapsulates that. You know, he's just like, oh, yeah. it's it's your fault. It's you guys are responsible for this. And, you know, he's he's yeah. really ultimately the root cause of it. And I mean, but just like, but even when he made all these like smart decisions, it seems like when it came to business and all of that, like some of the dumb ones he made too were just baffling. Like he, one of the times that he hurt himself, yeah. he was practice pitching in a small room and slammed his hand on a table. <laughs> I kid you not. It was it was like all stuff like that. Just things yeah. that made absolutely no sense. I think he hit himself on a bench at one time and it knocked him out for games. Who I mean, did he blame for that? <laughs> exactly. Just like not even game related, like not even while he was in the game. He'd just be doing yeah. something like a ding dong outside of the game and would hurt himself. But when he was told to go to rehab the one time for the one injury, he straight up said no and then turned around and told the press the whole entire team was bullying him. Like they are the ones who wanted to hurt him. He's a mess. Wow. 
Wow. Interesting individual. <laughs> yeah, very interesting individual. And I'm just still blown away by the fact that he worked so hard to essentially create a business. I mean, mm -hmm. he really made kind of a functional business, but yeah. they were selling illegal goods. Like, like, just shift it. Just shift it a little bit. Don't use a Nike logo. Make up some new logo or, you know, do some type of branding of your own if you're such a big celebrity or I know. whatever. That's that's what you would think. I think he I think it has everything to do with him spending that time in the Mexican League with the Wheeler dealers. I think yeah. he just saw such I think he realized his baseball career was never going to be what he wanted it to be and that he wasn't meshing in any way, shape, or form, whether it was just being a team player or being a good player. And I think from the way he went into it, it seems like he he saw this and he knew this was going to be a scapegoat. This was what he was going to do when he was let go yep. and he was set on it. He probably had these plans going for a long time. Mm. Wow. Wow. And I can't believe he's still on the run. It's amazing. I know. I saw that and I was like, this is unreal. <laughs> <laughs> he's, st he's still out there. Yeah. I wonder I if loved, he still calls Lewin. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I would have loved to have seen that meeting. Just like, what's the conversation at that point? What are these guys talking about? Um, just casually sitting in the chair waiting. He yeah. knows he's being chased. But then it's like, that sucks because he also knows no one's going to actually come after him. Right. Right. Crazy. Wow, Danielle. Well, she is back, ladies and gentlemen, in case you couldn't tell. Will I have enough to take her on with my story? We're going to find out soon. We'll be back right after this short break. Ladies, have you ever been let down by your hair products? Most companies generalize your hair needs and don't take into account things like regional climate, your diet, and your styling habits. Pros makes truly personalized shampoo and conditioners. I did the online questionnaire, and being someone that went through cosmetology school, I was blown away. Their in-depth process took into account where I live, how I live, and what goals I have for my hair. With their algorithm and over 50 billion formula combinations, Pros determined a unique blend of ingredients to treat my exact concerns. Based on your preferences, your formula can be vegan, gluten-free, silicone-free, which is what I chose, or fragrance-free, and every formula is sustainably sourced and cruelty-free. They made a custom pre-shampoo mask, shampoo, conditioner just for me, and they even picked up the fact that I have dry hair and suggested an additional hair oil. They even recommended scents based on my profile, and for me, they selected Beachy, so obviously, they know what they're doing. They also have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Get a free consultation and 20% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash crime after crime. Once again, that's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash crime after crime for a free consultation and 20% off. Custom hair care bottled just for you. Pros. Looking for something to do while you're waiting for the next episode of Crime After Crime? This episode is sponsored by one of my favorite mobile games, June's Journey. June's Journey is a free-to-play mystery game that will have you going from scene to scene, searching for items to unlock clues. You, as June Parker, will jump into a 1920s mystery that will take you across the world trying to solve the murder of your sister, Claire, and unlock your family's many secrets. The beautifully crafted scenes tell an intriguing story while also challenging your observation skills and keeping your focus sharp. As a matter of fact, sometimes I kick on some June's journey before I record a video or podcast just to get my brain going. Every scene and character adds a new layer to the story that keeps you wondering what will happen next and which clue will bring the truth to light. And if you need to give your mind a rest from the mystery, you can even use the coins you have earned through the game to build and decorate your estate. June's Journey has been downloaded by millions of people and has a 4.6 out of 5 star rating on the Google Play Store. It's available for free. Download it right now on Android and iOS mobile devices, and you can also find it on desktop through Amazon and Facebook. We've got a link in the description box below so you can download it while you listen to the rest of today's episode. Spend some quality me time with June's Journey. All right, guys, welcome back. And please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. And now I'm a little bit nervous. The way that John left that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared he's about to blow me out of the water here. <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, My comeback has to be great. <laughs> um, Danielle, I don't know if I'm going to blow you out of the water or if I'm going to take you to the mat. Oh my goodness. 
Now, here's something <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, that might be a hint. <laughs> here's something really interesting about this story is you probably don't know the person I'm talking about, Danielle. Okay. But I'm <clears throat> almost positive you've actually seen him before. Interesting. One of the most famous images in sports history is Muhammad Ali formerly known as Cassius Clay, in the ring back in 1964. He's standing over an opponent that's been knocked down, and it looks like Muhammad Ali is yelling at him. Mm -hmm. As popular as that picture is, many people don't know about the man on the floor and how his life was so entwined with crime, people still wonder to this day if his death was actually a mob hit. Oh, boy. Buckle up. I know. I'm, I'm already like, oh, man, here we go. <laughs> Charles Sonny Liston was born in Arkansas in 1930, we think. Apparently, oh Arkansas didn't make birth certificates mandatory until 1965. And it appears Liston may not have even known his own birth year. Census records from 1940 say he was 10. But for official documents, Sonny would use May 8th, 1932 for his birth date. His it's mother a big difference. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a difference there. Well, get this. He thinks his birthday's in May, but his mother claims that he was probably born in January because she remembers it was cold. Life in rural Arkansas wasn't easy for him. He's quoted as saying, the only thing my dad ever gave me was a beating. It's reported that the abuse from his father left scars on Sonny that could be seen years later. His mother and several of his siblings moved to St. Louis and Sonny followed them a year later. He tried to enroll in school, but being illiterate, he quickly dropped out. Finding steady work was tough, but Sonny found an easier way to survive. He started a life of crime. At six foot one with large shoulders, an 84 inch reach, and fists that measured 15 inches around, Sonny had an intimidating look and used that to pull together a gang of street thugs. They would commit muggings and armed robberies. Sonny would frequently wear a yellow shirt and would become known by police as the Yellow Shirt Bandit. In 1950, the Yellow Shirt Bandit would be caught. He was sentenced to five years in Missouri State Penitentiary for the armed robbery of two gas stations and a diner. While there, Sonny met Reverend Alois Stevens, who was working as the prison's athletic director. He suggested that Sonny give boxing a try. They had finally found something that Sonny was extremely good at and a possible way for him to re-enter society and become more than a common street thug. Reverend Stevens brought in a heavyweight boxer to show off Sonny's proficiency. After two rounds, the boxer quit the match. He oh, literally, yeah, my he, goodness. he literally said, this guy's going to kill me. I'm not going back in there. <laughs> <laughs> he was bad. Um, quote, he was the most perfect specimen of manhood I'd ever seen, Stevens told Sports Illustrated. Powerful arms, big shoulders. Pretty soon he was knocking out everybody in the gym. His hands were so large, I couldn't believe it. Reverend Stevens made a recommendation that Sonny be paroled, and in late 1952, he was released from prison. By March of 1953, Sonny won boxing tournaments in Chicago and New York, Within five months, he went from being a total unknown to amateur boxing champion of the world. In September of 1953, Sonny signed a contract to turn pro. However, his financial backers were tied to organized crime. Oh, no. Historians say the mob managed every fight and controlled every dollar. Less than a year after he was released from prison, Sonny was again heading back into a criminal lifestyle, acting as an enforcer for underworld figures between his professional fights. It's said that in one occurrence, he beat up workers that were on strike on the orders of his mob controllers. He was also known to work for one particular mobster as a chauffeur, a chauffeur that was really good at breaking legs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, listen to this. Sonny's first pro fight was in March of 1953. He knocked out his opponent, a man named Don Smith, in just 33 seconds. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's someone I wouldn't want to come face to face with. Seriously. This guy, I mean, just the description of him physically. And I think his fists are actually still the biggest for a heavyweight pro. I mean, I mean, 15 inches around. His, his, they were described as being like cannonballs. That's ridiculous. My whole face would just be gone. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> My whole face would be gone. Yeah. Well, and look what he's doing. 33 seconds and he takes yeah. this guy out. 
He continued fighting and winning, and he also continued the criminal activity. The police were catching on. It's reported that they had pictures of Sonny stapled to the visors in their cars. Sonny began avoiding driving on main streets. However, a police officer caught up with him on May 5th, 1956. Sonny assaulted the officer, breaking his knee, busting up his face, and taking the officer's gun away from him. He dumped the officer in an alley and walked out wearing the cop's hat. What do you think, Danielle? I mean, he doesn't care. He Seriously. doesn't care. He doesn't care. He knows he's big. And he's like, oh, really? Yeah. Okay, cop, what are you going to do? Because. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But of course, um, you know, that does land him in the city yeah. workhouse, which is a, a medium security penitentiary. He's in there for nine months. After that, he had another run in with a cop. That cop, he left headfirst in a trash can. You're lying. Nope. And yet another occurrence, officers were trying to subdue Sonny, and they were literally breaking their nightsticks over his head. The legend of how strong Sonny was continued to grow. However, he would wind up back in jail for six months, and he was suspended from boxing for the year of 1957. Sonny said that some of the officers were racist. And, you know, we're talking 1950s. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sure he was dealing with that. Uh, he had supposedly had his life threatened by a police sergeant, and he was being repeatedly detained and held overnight. So he eventually moved to Philadelphia. In 1957, Sonny would get married to a woman named Geraldine Chambers, who he met at a prison dance. <laughs> I didn't even know they had dances for prisons. I was about to say, I've never heard of that before, yeah. but okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Geraldine had a daughter from a previous marriage, and together they would eventually adopt a boy from Sweden. Sonny returned to boxing in 1958, winning eight more fights and picking up a new manager, someone once again with ties to the mob. By 1960, Liston was on a tear with nine straight knockout victories and was the top contender in the heavyweight division. However... His criminal dealings were now affecting his boxing career. The managers of world champion Floyd Patterson were not allowing a fight between the two because of Sonny's ties to organized crime. Sonny had two more arrests that year, one of them for impersonating a cop. He was once again suspended from boxing in 1961. Quick question. Yeah. So is he choosing these managers or... How does that work? There was an interesting problem that he had because um, he he was he was kind of such a big, imposing figure that not a lot of people would want to fight this guy. Yeah. So he needed managers that could make those kind of fights happen. You know, they, they'd have to be able to convince other people to get into a ring with him. So. <laughs> Because um, everyone's like, I'm not doing that. I'm not yeah. being wiped across this ring. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and his okay. reach is amazing. There's this other picture I saw where Muhammad Ali is boxing him. And his reach looks longer than Muhammad Ali's like body from his the end of his fist all the way to his head or even past to his other shoulder. It's insanity. I mean, yeah, it's, it's crazy um, the okay. size of this guy. So, and keep in mind that we're talking 1950s, 1960s, um, the mob had a lot of connections into boxing. Yeah. There was initiatives that were going on at that time where they were literally trying to clean up boxing. They were literally trying to get the mob out of boxing. Because it was so, so bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All so right, yeah, it, I was curious because I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. So it, it probably wasn't completely uncommon to have. As a matter of fact, the, the current champ, um, at least at this time, Floyd Patterson, mm -hmm. uh, they talk about him changing management too. And he winds up getting connected to someone that's in the mob as well oh, with man. his new manager. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was okay. it, kind of running rampant, but the drama around the championship fight that Sonny was trying to get with mm -hmm. Floyd Patterson would continue and even reach the white house. Oh, President John F. Kennedy advised Floyd Patterson not to fight Sonny saying the Justice Department knew he was connected to organized crime and Patterson should find an opponent with better character. Sonny would eventually change his management, and in 1962, the fight between him and Patterson for the world title was held in Chicago. Sonny Liston knocked out Floyd Patterson with a left hook to the jaw at two minutes and six seconds into the first round. It's just amazing. This guy just, he's crushing people. It's crazy. Sonny was expecting support from his new hometown of Philadelphia, but didn't find it. He literally thought he was going to get off the plane there and be able to give this big speech. He gets off the plane 
Oh, boy. And there's no one except for <gasps> a couple of journalists. And the journalists that were writing about him, yeah, they were talking about him in like racial slurs. Like I won't even repeat the stuff that they were they were publishing about him. But think of the worst racial slurs that you can. And oh, my goodness. Th- those were winding up in newspapers describing this guy. It was terrible. Um, they were also connecting him to criminal activities. They were writing about yeah. the fact that they thought he was connected to all this. Sonny insisted that police harassment was continuing. The new heavyweight champion moved his family to Denver, Colorado, saying, I'd rather be a lamppost in Denver than the mayor of Philadelphia. Patterson and Liston had a rematch in Las Vegas in 1963. That fight lasted only four seconds longer. He crushed him again. The audience booed his victory. Oh, wow. Yeah. Young boxer Cassius Clay, who would later be named Muhammad Ali, wanted a crack at the title, but Sonny wasn't making it easy. Ali would do several stunts to get his attention. In one, he parked a tour bus outside Sonny's home and called him out with a megaphone. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And there's footage of this. He's like yelling, I'm coward, coward. I want to get you in the ring. Um, Another was at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas. Sonny was playing craps when Ali approached him, once again yelling about getting a title match. Sonny pulled out a gun and fired it directly at Ali. And then again, two more times over the heads of people that were fleeing the casino. There's footage of this also, and I'm putting it in the YouTube version. So you guys might want to check that out. That escalated very quickly. Yeah. But get this. A moment after he fires off those three rounds, he aims the gun at a section of his own coat and squeezes off another round. And there's no bullet hole. Sonny's gun was shooting blanks. Oh, my goodness. Apparently, he was known to just carry this gun around that had blanks in it. I guess He's just like, hmm, how can we scare the crap out of people today? Yeah. yeah I guess just for a moment like that. Uh, Ali would later say, I act crazy. He is crazy. Finally, a title defense bout was set for February 1964 against Muhammad Ali. In the fight, Ali truly floated like a butterfly, avoiding several of the crushing blows Sonny was known for. Ali would land flurries of punches, and Sonny would return with some large ringing blows. The fight was about to enter the seventh round, but when the Mm -hmm. bell went off, Sonny wouldn't stand up from his stool and re-enter the match. Muhammad Ali was the new heavyweight champion by technical knockout. Sonny's corner said that his shoulder was too injured to continue. Some people say that was just a story drummed up to sell the rematch. Others say that this fight was rigged by the mob. Interesting. Now, believe it or not, that famous photo that I was telling you this is all from isn't from Ali winning the championship, which you would think was probably a bigger moment here. Yeah. It's actually from a rematch between them. Leading up to it was more allegations of organized crime connections, and that would lead to the match being relocated. But Sonny was training hard and was reportedly in the best shape of his career, which is a big part of what makes that photo so unbelievable. Yeah. Early in the first round, Sonny lunged at Ali with a big swing. And while moving away from it, Ali gave Sonny a short, quick right punch to the face. And Sonny went down to the mat. Some people refer to it as the phantom punch because they're not sure there was any contact made at all. Ali, in that photo, is yelling at Sonny, get up and fight, sucker. You're supposed to be so bad. Nobody will believe this. He also reportedly asked his corner, did I hit him? Fans were booing and yelling fix while photographer Neil Leifer snapped the most important photo of his career. Oh my gosh. It's one of the shortest fights in heavyweight history and people have been debating if it was thrown or if that punch actually did the trick ever since. Floyd Patterson vocalized that he also thought it was faked. Sonny Liston initially initially denied that it was rigged, but years later, Sports Illustrator writer Mark Cram said that Sonny told him, quote, Ali was crazy, I didn't want anything to do with him, and the Muslims were coming up who needed that, so I went down, I wasn't hit. Oh my gosh. Yeah. A lot of history in that photo that I just, I never knew about. Me either. After his loss to Ali, Sonny moved to Las Vegas and went to work for loan sharks and drug dealers. He did eventually get back into the ring in 1966 and started another knockout streak. 
During this time, he was also living a double life in Las Vegas, making appearances and signing autographs on one side and doing heavy drinking and drug dealing on the other. His last fight was in 1970, which he won by technical knockout, ending with an opponent that needed 72 stitches and had a broken cheekbone and nose. Wow. In December of 1970, Sonny's wife, Geraldine, was on a trip for the holidays to visit her family, and she hadn't heard from Sonny in several days. She returned home and noticed newspaper piled up at the front door. Uh, she entered the unlocked front door and found Sonny deceased in their bedroom. He'd been dead for many days, but she called a lawyer who came to the home and they tried desperately to reach a doctor. It would be several hours before the police were called. When they arrived, they found no signs of physical wounds, no weapon. They did find a small amount of marijuana and some heroin, but no syringe or other drug paraphernalia around his body. Some speculate that his wife may have cleaned up the scene. However, his friends claim he was terrified of needles and wouldn't have injected drugs. The coroner concluded that he died of natural causes, specifically lung congestion and heart failure. However, some speculate that this could have been a mob hit. Sonny wasn't as valuable as he once was. Plus, he had been around mob circles a long time and seen a lot over the years. Did someone want him silenced? Was he supposed to throw that last fight that he had actually won? Others speculate that possibly drug dealers wanted him dead and a mob hit wouldn't be this subtle. Liston's career ended with a record of 50 wins, 39 of them by knockout, and four losses. He also had 19 arrests. He's considered in the top 10 of world's greatest boxers to this day by several different publications and was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1991. Quote, of all the men I fought in boxing, Sonny Liston was the scariest, Muhammad Ali would later say. Charles Sonny Liston is buried at Paradise Memorial Gardens in Las Vegas, and the dedication on his tombstone simply reads, A Man. Oh, wow. Thanks to BBC, Wikipedia, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, Springs Toledo, Time Magazine, and J Rank for information contributing to today's story. I need Ooh. to sip my water. I know. <laughs> I need to breathe because that was a big one. <laughs> that was a big one. But holy crap, John. Isn't that crazy? I mean, all I can think about is the fact that I do think it was a hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot to that. And when you're talking about someone that's been in circles like that for so long, who knows what he had seen? Who knows who could be nervous about things that he had seen? Um, and... How do you deal with a man like that? There was another story oh, I exactly. heard. exactly. Yeah. He, I mean, he's, he's a monster. You're not going to go yeah. up and tell him you have a problem with him. If you're <laughs> going to take care of him, you're going to take care of him. Um, there was another story where I guess he was somewhere with a kind of a, a big mobster and he actually held up his fists, you know, like faking like he was going to punch the mobster. And the mobster tells him, if you hit me, it better kill me because one phone call and you're dead in 24 hours. See, this is what I'm saying. They don't play. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm sure, I mean, think about it this way too. If they're, if different mobsters are managing him for so long, and I mean, it's just, it's like he's undefeatable. They're gaining so much off of that. So yeah, the second that he yeah. isn't as valuable anymore. Right. And again, I'm sure they, they might have used him for who knows what to take care of a lot of their problems because he's such a big guy. And I mean, I don't know. Sounds a little bit sketchy to me. It is. And there's there's people that they're just, they're not sure about that death. Um, you know, the the things that they talk about. There, there were some scars that were found, I guess, that look like possibly needle marks inside one of his arms. But his friends have different stories about that. He had been in a car accident a couple months before. And they said that they thought that that might have been from the treatment of him going to the hospital for that. But they also yeah. said he was the type of guy that would avoid going to the doctor just for general checkups because he was afraid of needles so bad. He just didn't want any possible, hey, you need a shot and we're going to give you a shot. So it's kind of weird to think that heroin would be the thing. Yeah. Um, they did find some chemicals in his body that would suggest that he he did take heroin. One of the investigators was very clear that he he was aware that Sonny was using heroin at that point in his life. And Interesting. From, from some of the other stuff we're hearing about what he was doing, like at night, you know, he's going to these 
dive places in Las Vegas so he could just get drunk out of his mind and do drugs and or at least selling drugs. Um, but who knows who who he's dealing with around all that. So yeah. if it's not mob related, could be that it has something to do with drug dealers that he was interacting with. Or, you know, there is a possibility it was just a, a natural death. Well, you know what's so unfortunate to me about this story is that, you know, he felt pushed into crime as a child just to get by. And then, yeah. you know, how crappy is it to find something that you're good at and you are quite literally built for? And it all it does is shove you right back down the throat of crime. That makes me really sad for him. Yeah. Because there's, there's, there's no telling what he could have done or if he would have gotten out of it if he actually had a full opportunity to. Between that, um, the racism stuff that he was dealing with. Yeah. And then a very big thing about um, just imagine for a moment that you don't know your own birthday. Exactly. Like it's such I a mean, big sense of identity for us or – you you would look at it and maybe say, hey, was I not that important to my parents? And one of well, the things, yeah. you know, his dad had uh, between two different wives, his dad had 25 kids. Holy guacamole. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> even even Sonny had a bunch of other children outside of his marriage. But I don't I don't have a number on that. But um, you're talking a lot of children. And keep in mind the time that you're talking about 1930s. And his father was older, supposedly, uh, by the time he had Sonny. So his father, or at least his father's father, we're talking coming out of the Civil War. We're, yeah. we're, we're talking just finding your freedom and some states really not paying attention to that quite yet. Yeah. Um, so the way that he was treated when, when he was a small boy um, certainly laid the groundwork for a lot of, of what came in his life. But there was really... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's certainly a, a sense of... It's weird because in one way... I feel like I, I wish his story was told more often. There's been a lot of books that have been written about it. Yeah. But there's so many different important aspects when you're talking about a person like this and opportunity and how yeah. how do you make your way through situations like that? Um yeah, I was uh I'm pretty in 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 some ways I'm kind of impressed that he was able to do all all the things he did and Oh yeah, me too. That kept coming into the back of my mind when you were telling the story. Yeah. You know, and then it just made it that much more unfortunate to me that he kept getting kind of like brought back into mob circles. And yeah. Well, and how many whew. times have people looked at that picture and not thought about the guy that's on the mat and what the story is behind him, you know? Yeah, because that was a big moment for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Huge moment. Yeah. Oh, and and that picture is cited as one of the most important pictures in sports history. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You brought it. I tried. You did great. That was an outstanding story. Oh, well, thank you. I think <laughs> I think you did pretty good yourself. We just well, have thanks, to see. John. <laughs> we have to put these guys in a ring together and see. I'm pretty sure oh, who boy. would know. <laughs> Let's put them in some, in some fake shoes and give them some Rolexes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they probably end up working together. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being so serious. Somehow it would just all work out. <laughs> Seriously. Well, as usual, we did find a few other stories we want to share with you guys before we end today's episode. Danielle, let's start with you. The first one is a Sean White wedding. A Sean White <laughs> wedding. What a perfect name. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Snowboarding legend Sean White, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know, also known as the Flying Tomato, which I had actually never heard of that until I saw mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. He has three Olympic gold medals, and he got his first sponsorship deal at just seven years old, which is outstanding. Fame has opened so many doors for him, including being invited to the wedding of Black Keys drummer Patrick Carney in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, unfortunately... Sean had a little too much to drink and was arrested for public intoxication and vandalism after he pulled a fire alarm at his hotel, causing an evacuation of the building, and he also destroyed a hotel phone. Party. <laughs> I know. This reminds me of high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can we do that's so bad? Let's pull the fire alarm. <laughs> oh, my goodness. His mugshot shows Sean sporting a black eye. Apparently, he was being chased by someone and he fell. The flying tomato's face landed on a fence. <laughs> that is 
I'd be embarrassed if that were a story about me. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure he was having a good time, but you know, everyone else that was staying in the hotel that got evacuated when the fire oh, alarm went goodness. off. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a nightmare. Now, when you're in like high school, middle school, and someone pulls an alarm and you get to go walk outside for a minute and escape right. the class, that's fun for everyone. Right. When you've probably drank too much, may or may not have passed out in your hotel room after an uh, insane wedding, if I was woken up to a fire alarm, I'd be lucky if I made it outside. <laughs> and I'd be horrified. <laughs> yeah. I'd be sure I was going to be left for dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one to share with you guys, too. This is one I like to call accidental discharge. NFL wide receiver Plaxico Burris stands at six foot six and weighs around 230 pounds. He played with the Steelers, the Giants, the Jets, and he also apparently liked to play with unlicensed firearms. Oh, my goodness. When going out to a New York City nightclub, LQ, in 2008, Plaxico had a little accident in his own words, my friends and I stood at the bar for like five minutes and the place was packed wall to wall. The security guy suggested we go upstairs where we could get a table and chill and it wouldn't be so crazy. So we did and he led the way. I had a drink in my left hand and was walking right behind the security guard. The music was loud and I could feel the bass thumping the stairs under my feet, but I could barely see and I guess I missed a step and my foot slipped. My gun came unhooked from my belt and went sliding down my right pant leg. My instant reaction was to catch it before it hit the floor, and I reached down with my right hand to grab it. And I guess my finger hit right on the trigger because it went off. Oh, my goodness. The music was so loud that nobody actually heard the gun discharge. That's but, scary. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're, we're earplugs at uh, LQ. Um, but I knew that it had because I saw the flash of fire through my jeans. Oh, man. Plaxico had just shot himself in his right thigh with a Glock 9 millimeter, but didn't initially realize it until he noticed his jeans were getting wet with blood. Only a few hours before this, he was deemed unfit to play in Sunday's big game because of a hamstring strain oh, in no. the same leg. <laughs> Guy's got some bad luck. Seriously. Well, that's that's not the worst of it. Check this out. The front page of the New York Post would read, Giant idiot pin, <laughs> pinhead Plaxico shoots self in leg. <laughs> that's like a Florida man level headline I know it there. Is. Giant idiot. Yeah. Plaxico was indicted by a grand jury on two felony counts of criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree and a single count of reckless endangerment in the second degree, a misdemeanor. He wound up serving 20 months. He would come back to the NFL. However, his previous success seemed to elude him. He has spoken up in interviews saying that this mistake cost him a Hall of Fame level career, but it is part of his journey. Um if you ever get a chance to watch some videos of this guy, he is extremely likable, very, yeah. very well spoken. It's a real heartbreaker in, yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, but man, what I mean, he's going to catch grief for the rest of his life. He says he thinks about it every single day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Telling you, crazy things happen to these athletes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you, there could be a podcast just about athletes. On that note, who is going to win this month? Who brought the best criminal athlete story? Mm. It's my first time back. I won't be mad if you decide to vote for me. All mm. of you. I would like to keep this mug for a little <laughs> bit. Let's see how this goes. If you'd like you did. To... You, you brought a good one. I will say that. As much as I love, as much as I love to give you a hard time, that was a great. That was a great one. <laughs> wow, I was I was reeling from what Stephanie had done to me last month. So I, maybe maybe I threw in a little extra work on this one. If you'd like to vote, you can do it at, on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod for seven days after the episode releases, or. You guys can also vote on the YouTube version of this. Just hover your mouse or press your finger down on the screen. If you're on a mobile device, a little eye will pop up. Hit that eye, cast your vote, and you are good to go. All right. And for the next episode, we talked about it long and hard. And thanks to Becky Geiger, we have a suggestion here. We're calling the episode Craziest Evidence. So, Danielle, you want to describe a bit about what that's going to be? Well, it's kind of broad, so it could go a lot of ways, but 
it's kind of it reminds me a lot of our bizarre weapon story. Yeah. Like a crazy piece of evidence that solved a crime or you would never expect to be there. That's kind of the route we're going to go for. Yeah. There's no be, telling where this could lead us. Absolutely. It's going to be cool because um, it's probably going to be a solved crime, obviously. So yeah. it'll be neat to hear the whole arc of it. But yeah, I'm curious to see what type of stories we're going to dig up because it is very, very wide. I can imagine that the types of cases we're going to be looking mm -hmm. at is just a lot of different stuff. So, mm -hmm. And I think the person that suggested it said that they had searched toilet paper involved in crimes. And I think that might have been the craziest evidence they found. So yeah, yeah, Becky. Could be a little weird. <laughs> yeah, I might have to reach out to her and ask for some tips. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, if you are not sick and tired of us yet, you can find us all over the place. We both have YouTube channels and different social media. Just type in Danielle Hallen anywhere and you'll be able to find me. Yep. And you will also see us at CrimeCon. If you're coming, be sure to use code CRIMEAFTER2020 and you will get 10% off. And let us know if you do, because we want to give you something special when you come to meet us. Uh, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com to let us know that you used the code. Or if you also want to submit ideas like uh, many of the people do for episodes that we select mm -hmm. here. We're always looking for great ideas, so please feel free to email us. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons, you guys, again, that helped us a lot with the donation. And you guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. Plus, patrons get a special personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special where John and I usually butcher your name and then apologize for it repeatedly. <laughs> That's right. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way that you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. And if you want a matching mug and you can be a winner every month with it, only John mm -hmm. and I have to fight for it. You guys go to our merch store. It's teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. And that's it for us today, guys. We will see you next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye.